Hello everybody, it's Thylord Root again, and welcome back to an introduction to C++. I hope that you enjoyed my previous preface video, and uh, now we're going to actually try and get into the meat and potatoes of programming in C++. So, um, for the agenda today, um, we're first going to learn about the steps involved in compiling a C++ program, and we're also going to learn a little bit about the C++ language itself. And then we're going to utilize this knowledge and uh, work on a small example that could uh, show how to actually write a simple C++ program. So um, the first question you might have is, well, what is a C++ program made of anyway? And a simplistic view that's a little bit more generic than not is that programs are basically a collection of data and also actions on that data that you would put together to perform a simple task. And uh, basically the way you would go about this is you would start out writing C++ source code, uh, which is the code that you write, and then let the uh, compiler um, actually handle the rest and uh, put everything together. And so each source file that you have will be translated into uh, eventually uh, another representation that usually ends up being native machine code. The compiler usually gets as far as translating it into assembly language and then it has um, something called an assembler that will convert that into something called object code. And um, you usually split up your C++ program if it's uh, of moderate size and uh, different parts. And these parts are called translation units. And so from the actual C++ standard itself, a C++ program is then considered a uh, collection of zero or more translation units. So. Uh, what will basically happen is that you'll write your source code and you'll pass that to a, a special program called the preprocessor. And the preprocessor is responsible for making your code into a format suitable for the compiler. Well, anyway, that uh, output of the preprocessor uh, processor is passed to the compiler itself, and the compiler goes through a number of steps. So, um, the first of which is lexical analysis, which is um, the step where it tries to, um, if you think of your code as like a, um, a collection of sentences or paragraphs, then it tries to split up your code into um, the words that would make up that paragraph, and it passes it to something called the parser. Uh, and the parsing phase is largely concerned with uh, actually deriving some meaning from your code. And the output of the parsing phase is then passed to the compilation phase, which uh, would output, um, in most cases, your assembly. Well, this is assembled into a number of different object files, and those are linked together, perhaps, with something called a link library that you'll learn about later into uh, your final output, which is usually a program file. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the preprocessor, which you might recall is the first step in, um, in our actual compiling phase. And uh, what the preprocessor does is it actually takes your source code and it uh, actually creates a version of it that's uh, usable to the um, to the C++ compiler, and this is uh, usually called a translation unit. As we'll see, it's a little bit different than the actual source file itself. And um, you don't have to pass um, C++ code as input to the preprocessor. I've actually um, heard of people generating website content uh, using the preprocessor. Uh, but, you know, it's um, what it's designed for, and that's what we'll be using it for. And the preprocessor uh, has a macro language, and uh, what macros are, they're basically fragments of text that you could go through and replace with other text, and uh, this can be very useful. So there are a number of functions that the preprocessor performs, and the first 
function that almost all preprocessors perform before anything else is uh, the replacement of sequences called trigraphs and digra uh, digraphs. And so the deal with um, these trigraphs and these digraphs is that if you're on a machine that doesn't support the um, required character set for C++, then there are certain uh, sequences that can be used as a workaround. Most machines don't have this problem, so I'm not really going to go into this too much further if you're, um, if you're interested in this, look at your compiler's documentation. And then there's also um, uh, special kinds of text called comments, and comments are non-coding text. And so you could use these for things like documentation. We've got two forms in C++. We've uh, first got the multi-line form, and what that is is um, when you take your text and you stick it in between um, the um, slash star and star slash tokens and uh, anything in between those tokens and including those tokens are removed by the preprocessor before it gets sent to the compiler. And then there's also the single line form of uh, comment and that is basically um, anything starting with slash slash and up to the end of that line is removed by the preprocessor. So you can use these to document your code and the C++ compiler will ignore them. And then there's also uh, the include directive which is responsible for actually taking the files that you specify for those directives and um, actually dumping them into the translation unit. This is uh, another thing that kind of sets the translation unit apart from the source code itself. And you've got two different ways of including a file. If you put your file path in between angular brackets, then what will basically happen is that the compilers, uh, the compiler specifies a path to look for that file, and it'll look for the file there. And then if you put it in between uh, a pair of double quotes, then it actually uh, includes from your current working directory if it can find it there. And so um, we've also, uh, as I've stated previously, got um, a macro functionality. And in order to provide this, we need to be able to define macros. So we have the define directive, and uh, it's complement the un uh, the undef directive, which is responsible for undefining macros. And to define a macro, you basically uh, put this define directive, and then you put the name of the macro, and then you put what it's going to be replaced with. And there are also uh, functional macros that we'll discuss here in a bit that um, let you have parameterized macros. And uh, one final important thing that the preprocessor does is conditional output, which means that it'll only output certain segments of your code if um, it a certain condition is met. So uh, we have two ways of specifying this. We have if or if def, and then you put anything that you want to be considered for conditional compilation um, in between that and an indef directive. And um, in particular, if def is kind of a form of syntactic sugar. It's basically the same as um, if defined and then the name of the macro that you want to check for. So, uh, as I just mentioned, we have functional macros, and these are macros that take parameters. And so, for instance, you can have a function macro f that takes parameters a and b, and for um, what basically happens is that internally these um, get replaced, a and b get replaced with uh, the parameters that you pass into the functional macro. And so here, if we pass in uh, 1 and 2 to f, you can see that the result would be um, uh, 1 plus 2, because in the definition it's a plus b, and um, they um, a and b get replaced with 1 and 2. So um, 1 and 2 are called the arguments of uh, f in this case.
And uh, another interesting thing about the C++ preprocessor is that it's, um, it's also a functional language, which means a couple of things. The first is that um, there are no mutation of the, there's no mutation of macro values, and uh, you also have exactly one replacement for each set of arguments. So this is kind of analogous to the functions that you learned about perhaps in algebra or algebra two, and. Um, as a consequence, it doesn't matter to the preprocessor what the actual order of evaluation is for um, for function arguments. And um, another particularly interesting thing you can do here is uh, you can create what are called higher order functions. So um, uh, let's look at this function g that we've defined, for example. Uh, here we have um, Argument say and b that of course get replaced as normal, but we also have um, an argument h, which is a macro name, and uh, what we can do then is with this g function we can pass in uh, our f function from earlier, and uh, you can see that um, f gets evaluated and then. Um, substituted um, with um, its actual um, expansion from when we passed in uh, A and B. So uh, in this respect G would be something called a higher order function. It's a function that operates on other functions. And there are also operators that the preprocessor can utilize to help um, make uh, producing certain kinds of output easier. Um, so we have two in particular, the stringification operator which um, outputs um, two double quotes around the, the token that it's next to, and then there's a concatenation operator that takes two tokens and pastes them together end to end, as you can see in this example here. So, um, just a couple of final words about the preprocessor. Um, anything that the preprocessor does actually happens before compilation, and the preprocessor actually doesn't um, do anything as far as generating um, your object code. And so, remember, it only does text substitution. And because of that, if you have a functionality in the C++ language that you want to use, then it's often better to use that instead of the preprocessor to do it for you. And um, because of this, it's often said that the preprocessor can be easily abused. Some might even go as far to say that it's evil. Either way, it performs some useful functions that we need before we actually start compiling. And so um, now we've got this whole issue of lexical analysis. And if you remember, lexical analysis is the phase where um, we split up the actual translation unit contents into um, what are called tokens, or like words in a way. And we actually have a few um, different token types that we could use um, in a C++ program that have meaning. So the first uh, that we have are uh, literal, uh, literal tokens. And those are tokens that have some kind of intrinsic meaning, uh, some intrinsic data value. And there are also reserved words which the compiler looks at and have special meaning to the compiler. There are operators which are used to perform operations on data, and punctuators which act like punctuation marks in a, a language maybe like English or German. And um, then we have identifiers which are used to actually assign names to um, entities that you specify.